part of the TCAP project. He's um, overseeing um, some student research there at his institution about uh, beneficial and destructive uh, nematodes of wheat and barley. And he's collaborating with um, Aaron Carter at WSU on that project. And it's been very successful. He's done a great job attracting students to participate in the TCAT research. So we're really happy to have uh, Dr. Matuti here with us today to tell us about nematodes. Martin, are you ready to go? Yes, I am. All right, thank you very much, um, Dr. Sherman, for that, uh, I don't say flattery, but for the very good introduction. Uh, I'll start first by thanking uh, Amy yesterday, and uh, she helped me. We put everything together, and she took me through everything that I needed to know. And she made it so simple, it looks as if uh, anybody could actually do it. So thank you, Amy, for, for that great job you did yesterday. Um, our presentation this afternoon will be not so much as to what we've done research-wise, because we are just beginning. Uh, but rather, we'll be kind of safe highlighting some kind of an awareness of uh, plant parasitic nematodes um, and also perhaps free living nematodes. Not much of that today. The nematodes generally, as it relates to the TCAP project. So, uh, the main purpose of this, of today's um, talk, is to raise awareness to that and then also, at the end of the day, we'll end up also probably. Um, let the audience know what is it that we do at the UAPB. Um, so without uh, much ado, we're going to go st um, straight into what um, the talk is all about for today. Um, we'll start with an overview of nematodes. Uh, now, nematodes are the most abundant uh, metazoans on planet Earth. They are the most abundant metazoans on planet Earth. And four out of every five multicellular animals in the world are actually nematodes. Now, for the most part, nematodes are cylindrical roundworms. They are mostly microscopic, especially those that are plant parasitic. And they are found just about everywhere where they can get food to eat. Now, they could be found in very pristine environments to extremely polluted environments. Now, this attribute of theirs, that's what, this is what makes it possible for us to be able to use them as um, indicators of environmental conditions. Uh, at, as as um, Jamie said earlier, part of what we are doing in the TCAP will be also looking at the beneficial aspects of nematodes. Now, just to continue buttressing how widespread nematodes are, you could find them in very, very cold regions in the Arctic. You could find them in hot springs. You could find them on mountain tops. You could find them deep in the sea, fresh water, just about anywhere. If if you actually went somewhere and and nematodes were actually not found there, then it will be, it's going to be likely that uh, um, it, the, that environment is extremely, extremely hostile to living organisms. Now for plant parasitic nematodes, as I said earlier, they are exclusively, um, they are exclusively microscopic. Now with a trained eye, um, there are some female forms that can actually be seen, or there are some nematodes that can be seen with the naked eye. If, it, if your eyes are actually trained, but you're not able to see any details. So that's why here I say they are, they are I say here that they are exclusively they are microscopic. Now, one way to distinguish between a plant parasitic nematode and a non-plant parasitic nematode is that plant parasitic nematodes they do have they have a stylet. A stylet is a, is an anatomical structure they have around their mouth area, which is actually shaped like a spear. They use that for, for feeding. That's what they use in piercing plant material. Now, the for root for root nematodes, 
there are three groups of root nematodes. We have the endoparasitic, we have the semi-endoparasitic, and then we have the ectoparasitic. Then we also have uh, nematodes of stems, leaves, and seeds. So we can actually see from here that um, there do not seem to be any part of a plant that is spared of nematode parasitism. So nematodes could be a problem in any part of the tree. It just depends on which plant you are actually looking at or which crop you are actually looking at. Now this is an example. This is an example of uh, of uh, this is an example of an endoparasitic nematodes. Endoparasitic nematodes they are generally small nematodes because they have to live within the tissues. They have to live within the tissues of the of the of their plant host. Here you can see this is. I hope I'm not covering that. This is a stylet here. I was, remember we said it was more like a um, like a spear. This is a stylet right over here. And this roundish part you see at the base here, that's the stylet knob. It actually supports the stylet. So if this plant parasite, if it is feeding, this spear or stylet is going to be extruded. It's going to be extruded out of the animal so that it can actually um, and, and sap, you can actually suck out plant sap. So this uh, Pratilenchus is a small nematode and that's why you can actually afford to be exclusively endoparasitic. Then this, okay, this is still, um, that's still Pratilenchus. The next one, this is Hoplolimus. Hoplolimus is um, semi-endoparasitic. If you can see generally, it is a bigger nematode. It's a bigger nematode than, uh, than the Pratilenchus we saw earlier. If you look at the stylet here, it's supposed to be a longer stylet. And then this is a vulva here, so this tells us this is a female we're actually looking at here. This is a vulva, this is a vulva right here. Now, semi-endoparasitic nematodes, about 20% of their anterior part of the body is embedded into the plant tissue, while the rest of the 80% is actually hanging outside. Um, they are too big for the nemat for the whole nematode to be actually to be contained within the tissues of of their host plant. If that happens, the plant may die almost immediately. Then this is an example of an ectoparasite. And you can see here that uh, what I've done is uh, I have just uh, half of the diagram here. These are extremely large nematodes and you can see the stylet begins from here and then it continues and then it continues right down here. Now of course it is understandable why the stylet is that long because they are ectoparasite. They must be able to actually reach their reach the root tissues. So all of this parasite, all of this, um, um, most of this stylet here is actually is extruded outside the animal towards the lip region here, so they can actually make contact with um, root tissues and then uh, absorb the nutrients that it actually needs to absorb. Shapes of plant nematodes. There are generally three sh shapes of plant nematodes. You have the cylindroid or cylindrical, we have the pear shaped, and then we have the kidney shape. Now, this is an example of, um, okay, I hope I did not skip the first one. Okay, so th this is an example of a uh, kidney shape or bean shaped nematode. Um, have the as you can see the name here rotilenculus rotilenculus so what one of the things you're going to see here is it is only the female it is only the female that is kidney shape this is the male over here which is cylindroid cylindrical so it, this this type of a situation will be referred to as sexual dimorphism referred to as sexual dimorphism and of course the reason why the females actually have um, this um, this type of uh, anatomical architectural design just so that they they, are, they have enough space to produce as many eggs as possible. Now with the with the male here, if you can see this structure, you can see this structure over here. Here, here they are the two of them. They are called spicules. 
this is what the male actually uses to attach the female to itself so that sperm cells can be transferred from the male to the female. For this female here, we can actually see the vulva around this area. Now this is another, this, is, this one is pear shaped. This is the root knot nematode, root knot nematode, meladogyne, meladogyne, root knot nematode. The female is pear shaped. This is the male, it's cylindrical or cylindroid. So again, this is another example of um, uh, sexual dimorphism. So within the same species, the females, they look different from the way the males actually look like. Again, the, the anatomical design for the female here is just so that the female can actually contain as many eggs as possible. Now for this nematode, the, the one I showed previously, or, or root on nematode in particular, they could have, they could have up to, they could have hundreds or, or sometimes close to about a thousand eggs right in them uh, that, are, that the female can actually have inside it. And from a parasitology or parasite perspective, having many eggs is a strategy for survival. Then now let's move to the economics of plant parasitic uh, nematode. As I probably mentioned earlier, there's scarcely any plant which does not have its own share of plant parasitic nematodes. And this is very, very true, or more so for crop plants. Actually, plant nematodes, they actually compete with growers in terms of what they can get from these selected crop plants. And the plant nematodes are the number one biotic cause of crop loss the world over. Now, the only the only factor that is responsible for more crop loss per year than plant parasitic nematode is drought. Drought only. So biotically, plant parasitic nematodes, they are actually the number one cause of crop loss the world over. And, and this, this, this statistic I have here, I'm talking about up to 10% of total crop loss worldwide. These are statistics of uh, up to uh, 1989. And these statistics are actually um, based on in countries where they knew that, where they already know they have an awareness of plant parasitic nematodes, and where they actually try to take um, control measures. So in countries or in regions where they are not aware that plant parasitic nematodes are there and where no control measures are actually implemented, these values should be far, far higher. So, but if we just if we if we deal with this value that we actually have that I have presented here, now up to 10% of total crop loss is lost every year due to the activities of plant parasitic nematodes, and this translates to roughly um, 100 billion US dollars annually. That's a lot of money, and in cases where uh, the nematodes are known to exist, up to $225 million are spent annually for nematicides. Nematicides are the chemicals that are used to control nematodes. So what makes plant parasitic nematodes so destructive? What is it that they actually have? What's their capability? So the first point is, um, these are parasites in their own respect and pathogens in their own respect. I mean, as we all know, parasites and pathogens, they already, they, 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 they are destructive to their host. And if their host, because they get nutrients, they get nutrients from their host. So if their host, but in the case of parasites, they get nutrients from their host. And in terms of a pathogen, it is what is it that they actually produce that may actually end up uh, making the host either sick or um, with less vigor. So nematodes are, for, are um, first and foremost, they are parasites and pathogens. Then we do also have nematodes that are active vectors of viruses. This is especially true for ectoparasites. I showed you, I, I, I showed a slide earlier on when I showed, I showed an ectoparasite, Zephinema. And uh, Zephinema there, as you say, the ectoparasites that do not live inside the, inside the, the root system. 
so they they feed they move from one plant to another so if they fed on the plant that actually had uh, plant viruses as they feed in the next plant which was a clean plant they will go ahead and actually transfer those viruses into that next plant so even if the the, the nematode is not a problem to that particular crop it has succeeded in injecting viruses in that crop that will end up being a problem. Then the next thing is um, nematodes are their enablers. In the soil, we do have bacteria and fungi that are pathogenic to plants, but they do not have a way of gaining entrance into the plants. So what happens is once as a nematode feeds in a plant other in the form of other uh, whether the whether the nematode is an ectoparasite semi endoparasite or an uh, or an endoparasite once as they feed into plants or once as they get entrance into a plant they they create cavities cavities or entry entry points this opportunistic pathogenic bacteria and fungi they will now get into the plant via these cavities or entry points that were created by the nematodes. Now, when, now when, when this happens, so you may actually end up having a situation where in, in, a, um, in the roots of in a root system of a particular plant, you may end up having, you have a nematode there, you have viruses that were actually introduced, then you have bacteria, and then you have fungi. Those type of situations they lead to what we call um, disease combination or disease complexes. And cases of disease combination or disease complexes, they are more detrimental to the plant than even just one of these pathogens. Now, most of what I've discussed so I've said so far, these are not readily noticed. They are not readily noticed. Now for the fact that they are not readily noticed, it does not mean they do not exist. In areas where it is where, um, the, where an awareness of nematodes already exists, you may have nematologists going out into field plots and collecting samples. They may collect samples year one, year two, year three, right up to year number 19 and they may not ascertain that there is a nematode problem. But for the fact that up to year number 19, a nematode problem was not detected, it does not mean that a nematode problem may not arise by year number 20. So the reason why I'm saying this is even if a nematode even if we do not have a nematode problem this year, it is just a matter of time. The only way that we can actually stem the activities of plant parasitic nematodes is that um, nematologists, they have to continue have to be doing the monitoring on and all the sampling every year or every time so that once as a problem begins to arise, the one that it is there and then corrective measures will be taken. Now so how will you recognize that how will you recognize that um, a particular field or a particular plant is actually um, infected with plant parasitic nematodes? Now as you can see here I have, I have a couple of uh, above ground symptoms here. Now I must say very quickly that these symptoms are not only limited to nematodes. Other pathogens, I know if you have any plant pathologists among us here, they will, they will attest to that. Other pathogens can also bring about these symptoms, dead plants, stunting, chlorosis. The, the only way, the, the, the reason why these are actually, the, we, we know for certain that these are ascribed to plant parasitic nematodes is because number one, control experiments have been carried out, and then number two, um, if, if it is a field, if it's a field situation, one has to go out there physically collect the samples, either the root samples and the soil samples, and then go back to the lab and actually make the analysis. However, these are some of the um, above ground symptoms, dead plants, stunting, chlorosis, yellowing of foliage, reduced yield, loss of crop. Loss of crop, it could be slight to total. It could be slight to total. So, so these are some of the 
uh, these are some of these uh, above ground symptoms of nematode infection. And um, this is uh, this is an, um, a wheat field that has been damaged by by nematode. Um, you can see here that this is another field over here, but this is not wheat. You can actually see here. You can actually see over here where I actually have the pointer that um, you, there's some, these are kind of say patchy spots in the field. These are patchy spots in the field. The other areas further up there that you have. Uh, uh, um, a large level of uh, plant vigor, it had to, it, it was certainly going to have little or no nematode, but this area, this patchy area, if you did any sampling here, you're actually going to get a lot of nematode. You can see that the plants there, they are, they are, they are barely surviving. Now, this is another example over here, where we have, um, we have uh, yellowing or chlorotic leaves. And of course, we know once that leaves become chlorotic, then uh, or yellowish, then sometimes their their ability to carry out photosynthesis is becomes simply um, uh, seriously compromised. This is another patchy field here where nematodes actually abound. Again, you can actually compare that with other parts of the field where have a uh, luxuriant growth. So, what are some of the what are some of the below ground symptoms of uh, nematode? In infection. Again, like I probably said earlier, it, it may be difficult to distinguish that from other biotic and abiotic factors in the soil. So the best way to know is that um, a, a diagnosis will have to be done. If it is the root, you take the roots and you see if you can extract any nematodes from the roots, uh, if it is, or if you can extract nematodes from the from the um, rhizospheric soil, that is soil around the rooting system. Now, but again, with a trained eye, if you took a root system that was infested with cyst nematodes, cyst nematodes, they are relatively large nematodes, and that you should be able to actually see with the naked eye, if with a trained eye. Now, other symptoms that you're going to see with the rooting system is going to be um, the reduction in size, pruning, lesions, stubby, root swelling, or root knot root proliferation, coiling, and so on. Now, if all of this happens to a root system, the affected root, that, so the, the root is going to be affected anatomically and physiologically. And once that the root is affected anatomically and physiologically, then the function that it's actually supposed to uh, carry out, for example, anchorage, or the absorption of um, uh, water and minerals from the soil, all of that actually is going to be compromised. And if that is compromised, then of course, we do not expect the plant or the crops to actually do well in the field. Now, so this is um, Heterodera avene here. It's, um, it's a nematode that has been reported to be very, very devastating in wheat. Um, this whitish round this stuff you actually see in here, this, uh, these are the females. These are the females. So, like I said, with a trained eye, uh, one can actually see this um, even just using a hand lens, and, and you know that okay, there's actually a nematode problem there. Then here you can actually see this is a root system that is actually being infected by nematodes. You can actually see that it it does not look like a normal root system, and therefore it cannot perform the job of a normal root system. Now, now this is another. One I put here, but uh, this is not with. This is um, this is for tomato plants. This for tomato plants. I put it here just for demonstrative purposes. Now on here, this is a root system that is infected with the root knot nematode. So you can see you can see the root the root system here it has a lot of swellings or knots like the like the knot in your tie. While on my right here, this is the normal root system. This is the normal root system on my right here. Of course, while, while the routing system on my right is going to perform the normal function of the routing system, the one on my left will scarcely be able to be functional. Now, this is, this is just some more examples of a routing system that is infected with plant parasitic nematode. Um, the, the, the swellings we see here, they are actually caused by the root knot nematode. So, if you took any of these swellings and you, you macerated them, you should be able to find all of those uh, nematodes in there and uh, with all, all of their developmental stages from eggs to the adults. So, 
after after giving that introduction, so the next question is going to be: so what is the um, the let's say something about the TRITC and the nematodes. Now, the uh, as we are aware, the the two the, the two crops that the TICA project is actually working with is barley and uh, and wheat, and based on um, um, a known statistic, but this was about since 1989, 6.3 percent of all barley that is actually produced is lost annually due to the activities of plant parasitic nematodes, and this is uh, this is be this is estimated to. Um, to be more than um, um, 1.1 billion dollars in loss every year. For wheat, it's even higher, 7.0 percent, and this is estimated at about uh, more than 5.8 billion US dollars annually. I think there's a lot of money and uh, a lot of time wasted in terms of the the the, uh, the growers. So. Um, with this, with these figures, even if they are not current, with these figures are not current, one may want to ask the question: uh, The TTC nematodes are they important? I'm sure the answer is going to be yes, that they are actually important. So, so what is our role in the TICA project? What is our role in the TICA project? As uh, Jamie said earlier. Uh, our, our group we have we have two main functions. We have to make functions for the TICA project. Number one is as new lines of um, these crops are actually being bred or developed, we will actually be screening them for nematode host status or nematode resistant. We'll try and we'll see whether they are resistant or very susceptible to plant parasitic nematodes. Our second job uh, is We'll, we'll also we'll look at the, the free living nematodes in the soil. We'll look, uh, we'll look at the nematode soil, uh, the, the soil uh, nematode food web structure. Using the free living nematodes, you have the, the bacterial feeding nematodes, the fungal feeding nematodes, then we'll have the omnivorous nematodes, and we'll have the carnivorous nematodes. Now, using these four trophic groups depends on the types and the numbers that we actually find in the soil. That could actually be weaved in into their in, in uh, into a structure into a nematode uh, food web structure, which we'll be able to tell us whether that soil is healthy or not healthy. We can also use that information to monitor whether the soil conditions are changing or not. As I was discussing with my colleague um, um, Aaron Carter and WSU, uh, we're saying that well. Um, in as much as we want to grow lines of wheat or barley that are, that are resistant to, to pathogens or high yielding and all of that, we also want to be sure that uh, the crops that are actually growing, uh, we, also want to be, we also want to exactly know what impact do they have on the environment. So again, that we can actually use nematodes in doing that. Um, yeah, uh, Jamie also mentioned this earlier. I collaborate, we collaborate with Dr. Aaron Carter, Washington State University, uh, in the Crop and Soil Science program. Now, our study fields uh, we have them in Washington State, and we have them in Arkansas. The the three we have in Washington State. Um, Magrigon is for spring wheat, and the other two are for winter wheat. Almoto and Colton, they are for winter wheat. In Arkansas, only winter wheat is actually grown, and these are our three fields in Arkansas, McDonald, Turner, and Algoa. Now, the, the way we carry out our field studies, we'll be, we'll be collecting samples in our fields three times per growing season. We're going to collect samples pre-plant, mid-season, and harvest. Now, for our fields in Washington State, we have actually um, completed our initial soil sampling for all of the fields. We are now actually, uh, um, in the next couple of weeks, we should be doing this, we should be doing our mid-season sampling, doing our mid-season sampling in next couple of weeks. Um, in Arkansas, the pre-plant sampling that's towards winter is actually in progress. 
but just to give you an idea, uh, if we let let's let's take one of our, our fields in in Washington State, our motto, where did this is what our these are the four species of plant parasitic nematodes that we've actually found um, in the group that we call the CP2 or PL2 uh, group, colonizer persistent group. We'll be able to, uh, we'll be able to uh, we identified for our initial profile, we identified um, four genera of nematodes in this CP2, at the CP2 level or CP2 group. And then um, this is the one, if I go back here. Now among them, this one here, the uh, Silencus hilarorus, this was the one that we actually found, this was the one that we found in all of the samples, all of the samples. Now these are nematodes of the CP2 group or PL2 group, they are generally very small nematodes, so you can actually see here, this is a, this is a very small nematode. And nematodes that are very small in size, not that they are not economically important, they have to be in very, very, very large, very, very, very large numbers. So they feed on plant bed by virtue of their size, by virtue of their size, um, their destruction is as not as great as larger nematodes. Then the, the, the other class of nematodes we found in our uh, pre-plant um, soil profile of Almoto in Washington State we had them um, four genera of what four genera of four species of uh, of nematodes. We have the Cirrhasis nematode, Lance nematode, the root knot nematode, and the stunt nematode. Now, among these four, the the one that was dominant was uh, Heterodera avene. That was one that was actually dominant among these four. Now, this is um, this. Is this is the serial cyst nematode here, Heterodera vene. This is the female. Now, this stage in the middle here, it looks like sausage or banana. It is um, it, it is destined to be a female. So, Heterodera is one of those type of nematodes, as we said earlier, that um, it practices sexual dimorphism. So, the larval stages, after larval stage two, if they're going to be females, then they'll start bloating out, as we are seeing here. So it means that this, this is a larva stage three, which will end up actually being a female. Then, of course, this is, this is actually uh, destined to be a male or a male already. And then this is, um, this is a wheat root here. And you can actually see these are the nematodes right here. You can actually, again, with a trained, with a trained eye, even if you do not use a microscope, you may be able to see something that will tell you that, okay, I think those are the nematodes I'm actually looking at. Now here, this is, heterodera, this is a heterodera female. Now, this yellowish part we are seeing here, this is an egg mass or an egg sac. So, the eggs, once they are produced in the female, this is where they actually mature. They mature here. They mature, they mature here and they mature here and then they will be released to the, later on, this egg sac is actually going to um, explode and all of the eggs that it contains, sometimes hundreds or thousands of eggs, they are going to be released out into the environment and then they will hatch and then the, the circle will actually continue. Now, so based on the our initial sampling that we've done so far, we've realized that uh, among the plant parasitic nematodes, now Heterodera avene and uh, Silencus hilarorus, this were this these two general, two, two species, were actually recovered from all the samples. Now, um, the Heterodera, because it is a CP3 level nematode, it is uh, more destructive than a CP2 level nematode. And from our initial sampling thus far, we found out that, we found out that uh, up to 272.2 were recorded per 100 milliliters of sample of soil. Now, from from every standard, this is these are actually high initial population. These are actually high initial population. Now, because of this, we don't know though. But because of this, we are actually expecting. We are actually expecting that if any of the new breeds that might 
collaborators actually working with. If any of the new breeds, we plant, if any of the new breeds we planted it, planted in this field, if any of them we planted in this field that is susceptible that is susceptible to plant parasitic nematode, then we are actually expecting that heterodera avene may actually end up being a problem. However, we will have to wait and see whether it's going to be true or not. If we end up realizing that some of the lines that are actually bred there, they end up developing high populations of heterodera, then that's good for us. If it ends up being that they are very, very susceptible to heterodera, then that will not be very good news for us. These are the students that are in our lab, and um, they, uh, they, they, they have been working very, very hard, and they are actually looking forward to um, some uh, internships this summer in Washington State University. All of that was actually organized by my collaborator, Dr. Aaron Carter, and also Dr. Jamie Sherman. So, we are, as, as Jamie said earlier on, we are at the Pine Bluff. We are actually taking the, um, our investigation of nematodes of which very seriously, and we are hoping that uh, um, other teams that are associated with the TCAP project, that they will also want to start thinking that uh, nematodes are very, very important when it comes to um, crop production generally. Thank you. So it looks like we have some time for some questions. Um, yes, uh, Tyson's applauding. Thank you so much, Dr. Matuti. But um, I'm wondering if anyone has any questions. If you have a question, you'll need to chat in using typing into the chat box. And we'll, we'll read the questions, and, and then uh, Martin will answer them. So um, any questions from the group? Dina's typing in, um, so hold on a second, and we'll see what she has to say. She says she doesn't want to ask a dumb question. Uh, it, no, there's no <laughs> dumb question. There could be a dumb answer, but not a dumb question. <laughs> Is there plant host resistance to nematodes? Is her question. Right. Yes. Um, oftentimes, what happens is um, plant breeders they have come on to they they develop um, some crop varieties or cultivars that are resistant to nematode for the first year that resistance holds, but by the time the crop is planted the second year, that resistance is broken. So, um, the, I am not aware that we actually have crops that have successfully been grown for nematode resistance. What, what some plant um, breeders do now somewhere in California that I know is, is, for something like grapes, they actually take one type of a plant and they Kind of superimpose it on another plant. I don't know what I, I, I don't know what terminology is used for that. They see if they have something like a root stock, a root stock that they put in the soil, and then they, and, and and then and then the plant itself, say the grape plant itself, is kind of say attached to attached to or grafted to that root stock, and then it grows without nematode problems. But oftentimes, but oftentimes, um, the, the plants that have been bred for nematode resistance, after one or two crops in the field, that resistance is broken, the nematode problem continues. Yeah, that's really interesting. So, Dina, I guess you answered your question, and she says, thanks. Amy asks, 
uh, grafting is the horticultural okay. term. Okay. Oh, she's letting okay. you know. Okay, grafting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yes, I guess that's it. Yes. Thank you. So, so I guess that's a function of how many different types of nematodes there are that uh, the resistance gets overcome. Um, and Dean, Dina said, I guess that's job security for plant breeders. Uh, it sounds like an area that needs a lot of yep. work. I agree. So, so it's, I'm, glad that you're, I'm glad you're drawing our attention to it. Uh, Tyson asks, if nematodes cause such large losses, why are more nematicides used, or why are they not? Why are they not? So, how do the nematicides work, Martin? And and what is some of the factors limiting their use? Okay, well, I'm glad that uh, Tyson is from UC Davis. Yeah, I actually did my postdoc there. But one of the problems that uh, I well, I don't know that Tyson knows, Doctor. Um, Howard Ferris, that's my, that I worked with him when I was out there. One of the problems that they actually found in California was um, the nematicides that they were using for controlling nematodes, they started finding these nematicides in groundwater. So the state kind of banned the use of nematicides. So for the most part now, um, if um, they, they Permits are rarely given for the use of nematicide. They are given sometimes, but they are rarely used, They are rarely given, and so the the what nematologists try to use for the most part now is using non-chemical ways, non-chemical ways of trying to uh, control these nematodes. It could be it could be via uh, crop rotation where um, you use them. So if let's say you planted let's say uh, wheat this season and the dominant nematode was, say, Heterodera avene. Now, if we know that corn, for example, is not very susceptible to Heterodera avene, then we may want to add corn in that rotation so that that way, maybe uh, by the time you bring back wheat into that rotation, the population of Heterodera must have reduced to a level where it will not constitute that much damage. So crop rotation, crop rotation, it's um, it's um it's it's one of the one of the the major ways in which uh, uh, nematodes are currently being uh, controlled or managed to a very large extent. So it sounds like it's really important to know which nematodes infest which exactly. plants, and and then also to uh, know you know what's hitting your yes. crop. Uh, so that you could plant something different. Yeah, that's that's exactly. interesting. Uh, so, so are the nematicides um, harmful to other animals? Yes. Is that why they're controlling yes. their use? Yes. So, um, so if if you put nematicide in there, of course, of course, nematicide they are chemicals. So when they go in there, they are not only killing the nematodes, but they end up probably also killing some of the the bacteria or the fungi that actually end up contributing to soil fertility as well. So it, it ends up having, um, they, they end up acting more like some kind of an ecocide. So not, it's, not, it, it's not going to be specific in killing only nematodes, but it will actually end up killing other beneficial microorganisms in the soil. And even, um, and even if it was killing only nematodes, as I said earlier, we do have beneficial nematodes. If, if, for example, if you have an abundance of bacteria feeding nematodes or fungi feeding nematodes in the soil, that's very good for you because um, with the with bacteria feeding nematodes, if uh, when they when they when they feed on the bacteria, any any nitrogen in excess of their body. They excrete that to the environment, and this nitrogen that the plants actually need. The same goes for the fungi. So we have beneficial nematodes in this. So apart from actually using them as indicators of soil conditions, um, free living nematodes. If they if you have them in very large quantities in the soil, they they um, they are what we may call the decomposers decomposer, and by that they do a lot of. Uh, mineralization in the soil which is good which is good for plant growth so are there ways to increase the number of beneficial nematodes in the yes soil? one one way I've been using um, 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 organic 
organic, organic sources of fertilization. Might be organic sources of uh, organic sources of fertilization. So manures yes. and and yes. So so manure in particular will actually end up increasing the number of uh, bacteria feeding nematodes, number of bacteria feeding uh, nematodes, and then uh, with um, that's that's for that's for uh, for animal for animal manure. Then if it is um, plant manure. That, but that will probably have a tendency of maybe increasing more of the fungal feeding nematodes. Well, that's interesting. So the organic uh, makeup of your soil affects uh, which nematodes are yeah. present. Yeah. Yes. So, so how do they? How do you end up getting a really bad? Uh, concentration of some of these pathogens is it by re, is it by repeating the same crop over and over again is that a primary yes. issue so, or yes so that's so that's one is is repeating the same crop over and over again but two also it could it could be that you are planting if you are, if if you are, if the stock that you are planting if it's already infected so just depending on what you are planting so in some cases you are planting material that is infected already so once you put it in there the nematodes will just bloom and I, let me just take one step back Nematodes they can complete their life cycle within uh, between three weeks and four weeks. So the turnover for their reproduction, especially the smaller nematodes, is very very high, very very high. Yeah. So if you plant the same crop in the same field for a long period of time, that's recipe for a high population uh, build up. If you planted already um, infected material, that will also be that will also be uh, a problem. It's sometimes irrigation water also, it depends on where you're getting your irrigation water from. If it's coming from a stream or from a river with that have nematode, then what you'll be doing is that you you just simply be piping nematodes into into your field. So there are so many different ways and if if a nematode problem is actually suspected and a nematologist comes around, those are the different those are the different things that different questions will be asking and actually testing so to actually know exactly where where the problem is actually coming from. So you seem kind of surprised that how high the rate was uh, of nematodes in I, I assume it was the WSU yes. soil that you were yes. looking at. What what do you have an idea of why the it was so well, high? Well I, I think some of those fields were already planted with um, wheat before. Some of those fields already planted with by, with wheat before, so I, I think that that should that should be that should be the only explanation for that particular one. So if let's say they had had a wheat crop there uh, one or two seasons back, and those nematodes, the one thing with nematodes is that you cannot completely eliminate them. If they do not have uh, proper sources of food. Their population can be dwindling gradually, but they cannot be completely they cannot be completely eliminated. So I'm suspecting that that field already had um, a wheat crop either the year before, or I, maybe I have that somewhere in my notes somewhere either the year before or two years back. I, I think that may be only be the only logical um, uh, explanation. In other words, there was a, there was uh, there was already a crop in that field that was very susceptible to heterodera. Mm -hmm. So I'm sort of monopolizing. Does anybody else have a question? David May is typing, so we'll wait okay. for him. One one thing that you can think about while we're waiting for him is um, I'm wondering how long does it have to be between you, how long do your rotations have to be before you reduce your load enough? So, so say I planted wheat this year. How long do I need to wait before I could plant it again? Um, that 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 question would that that question would depend on the, the load of nematodes that we actually have in the soil, and it's um it, it's something that where for every field uh, or for every farm, it will have to be studied. In some yes, in mm -hmm. in in some cases. It could be after one crop you rotate. In some other cases, it could be after two crops you rotate. 
And in some cases, it, it could be that if you, if, if, you, if, if, you, if you plant, let's say, with this year, you have to take for about another, after two growing seasons or so before you actually come back there. That's when the population must have been reduced significantly. So um, in each of these situations, you actually need some kind of uh, uh, a specific uh, location study. There, 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 really, there, there really isn't any one type of um, um, uh, treatment that you can say, okay, maybe after every one crop you actually rotate. No, some specific study has to be done in a particular field for you to come up with that information. Interesting. Well, David is, is still typing, so we'll just wait. Oh, here he, oh, he wrote a lot. Was the fact that nematode resistance was overcome after one growing season due to subsequent infection with a separate species of nematode, or was it due to the fast generation time of plant parasitic nematodes and survival of resistant individuals? All right. Thanks. For the for the most part, if you go to if you go to any particular field where you have a particular crop species, there, uh, um, you will find out that um, you have just you end up having just one major species. You may have a secondary and a tertiary one. So, if it is the same field for the same crop species, the problem is with that one particular species. And its population will keep on growing so long as it actually has a suitable host to actually feed with. So for the answer to this question is, it's the same species, it's just that it grows faster because it has, it has an, an abundance of food supply. David, do you have a follow-up to that or is that, did that answer your question? So while David's typing, some of you may need to go. I just want to thank uh, Dr. Matuti again. Uh, so uh, David says, I'm a little confused because I thought that a resistant variety planted would actually reduce the reproduction rate of the nematodes. Yes, yes. There's no confusion about that. Is it, if if you if if you have a resistant variety there, that means that means that. The nematodes do not have a suitable source of food, so their so their population is going to dwindle. But if I understood his first question, he was asking. I I, I did not understand that, that was what he was asking for his first question. If I understood his first question, the first the question was um, was the fact that nematode resistance was overcome after okay after one growing season due to subsequent infection with the species of nematode, or was it due to fast generation? Time of plant parasitic nematode survival. Ah, uh, okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. I, I. Okay. I see what she's saying. Yeah. Um. If resistance, if resistance is broke. Yeah. Okay. He's correct. Okay. I do not understand his question. The this question he was asking is, if if you planted a resistant variety and after a while it became, uh, if the resistance is broken, is it broken for that nematode or? Is it that a different nematode that's actually taking the niche of that previous nematode? The answer is correct. It uh, it becomes resistant to another species. Because it's not another species. That's correct. Hmm. Or rather, it becomes it, right. Okay, it, so what you're saying is that becomes susceptible to another species. When it's yeah. overcome, I see. So when it's overcome, it's because a new species exactly. has come in that's yes. also parasitic. Yes. Okay, got it. Okay, David, is that does that answer your question? He's typing, so
Yeah, so so he's interested in, in winter wheat breeding for okay. nematode yeah. resistance. Yep. And in he's just started here in okay. Montana, so um he's 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 just starting to work on this with the winter wheat breeder oh, this, here this, in Montana. So he's Okay, yeah, this, this would be interesting. Since I since that he's specifically breeding for nematode yeah. resistance, this would be very interesting. Yeah, and and so they're just starting to, I think to get an idea of what's okay. present and Okay. and all that okay. sort of stuff. So maybe you guys yeah. could talk later. Um, so Tar Tyson asks, so would alternating between resistant and non-resistant varieties be as effective as rotating crops? Or maybe different sorts of resistance, Tyson. Maybe that would work if you had a, a line resistant to this type of nematode. And then that's interesting. Probably no one's done it because we don't have we don't really have a crop yes, maybe that, that we is, know or we don't have a weed that exactly, we know is resistant exactly that's why i'm saying so at the end of the day um all of that investigation has to be done all that has to be actually be done and then okay this crop is a non-host so it's a, it will be essentially rotating non-host and host crops yeah interesting so Dean is saying, I think there are resistant soybean varieties. Yes, um, some have actually been bred for they've been bred for resistance. Uh, the, the 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 resistance, as I said, it will hold for a while, and after a while, it's broken up because other 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 nematode species they actually they actually come in, they actually come in and they start infesting. That's why I said earlier that while there may not be a problem in the 19th year, they may end up being a problem in the 20th year. Yeah, I see. And David says there are uh, several good sources of resistance to Pretty species. Um, yeah, yeah. So only to species, yes. Nematodes. Yeah, the certain. Yeah, in win David says in winter and spring. So there's other uh, nematodes that can infest. I see. Well, I just we've our numbers have dwindled. Uh, but uh, I'm sure that Martin would be willing to answer any questions. Um, if anybody has a question, I can get his email to you. Um, we really appreciate it, Martin. Uh, we, I really enjoyed and learned a lot today. And so um, thanks a lot. Thank you all for listening. <laughs> all right, that would be great. Yes. So yes. So David, yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to him contacting me. I, I, I'm, I'm really excited that uh, he is working specifically on nematode resistance. I'm really excited about that. Great. And I'll, I'll get him your email, okay. Martin. I'll That'll make sure he has it.